Prime Minister will first make an opening statement in Hebrew, then in English, and then you can ask questions in English only, please. אזרחי ישראל, לפני מספר ימים דיברתי עליכם ואמרתי לכם שמצבנו אז היה הרבה יותר טוב מאותו היום שהייתי מחויבת להודיע לעם שהותקפנו מחדש על ידי שכנינו. לצערי, גם היום אינני יכולה לבשר לעם שהמלחמה נגמרה והניצחון איתנו. כי אז גם היום אין ספק בלבי שהניצחון יהיה איתנו. אבל עדיין המלחמה לא נסתיימה. עדיין הבנים החיילים, המפקדים, החיילות, גם בחזית הצפונית וגם בחזית הדרומית, עדיין נלחמים. במסירות, בגבורה, ביכולת, ברוח שאין מילים לתאר אותם. ואני מאושרה שאני יכולה להגיד שהעם בעורף לא מפגר אחרי בניו בחזית. הרוח החזקה בעם, מידת ההתנדבות בעם לכל דבר ולכל עניין, זה למעלה ממה שאפשר היה לצפות. אנחנו עם קטן, מוקפים בשכנים עוינים. במלחמה הזאת משתתפים לא רק צבאות מצרים וסוריה, כי אם תגבורת בצורות שונות, אם זה בטנקים, אם זה באווירונים, במדינות יותר רחוקות. גם עיראק, גם אלג'יריה, עכשיו ירדן נכנסה עם כוח טנקים, גם מדינות ערביות אחרות. ומעל הכל, בגיבוי ובעזרה מסיבית של ברית המועצות, עם רכבת אווירית מתמדת, גם לסוריה וגם למצרים. אלה הן העובדות, ו... אנחנו מתקדמים, אין זאת אומרת שהדרך היא פתוחה, הכוח שלנו הבוקר היה צריך לנהל קרב עם חטיבת דיוויזיה של טנקים שבאו מעיראק, לשמחתנו חיסלנו החלק המכריע של הטנקים האלה והכוח שלנו מתקדם. אזרחי ישראל, אלה הן העובדות. אין צורך, אין יכולת להגיד דברים אחרים מחוץ לכך שמצבנו יותר טוב. אין כל מקום לייאוש, חלילה. אין ספק בליבנו שבסופה של, של המלחמה אנחנו נהיה המנצחים. לא אנחנו התחלנו במלחמה, אבל כאשר התקיפו אותנו נילחם עד הניצחון. הבה ונקווה שלא יעבור יותר מדי זמן עד סיום המלחמה עם ניצחון ישראל, לחיילים בכל החזיתות, באוויר, ביבשה ובים. כל האהבה 
לכם. ליבנו איתכם של כל אזרח במדינה, בין שאתם בן של אחת המשפחות. כולכם בנינו, כולכם בנים של כולנו. נתראה, אני מקווה, בקרוב אחרי הניצחון הגדול של צבא ההגנה לישראל. Ladies and gentlemen, Israel again has been attacked by its neighbors, those on its borders, and Arab countries that are far away, including help from Iraq, Algeria, Tunis, and others. And above all, one of the two great powers in the world has not only for over six years prepared both Egypt and Syria and Iraq with all the war material that they could possibly accept, that they could integrate into their armies, the best of what they have for over six years, training the officers and men, teaching them the theory their theory of war, of attack. The Soviet Union did not come to Egypt and Syria to teach the people, the Egyptians and the Syrians, how to uh, be prepared against an attack. They knew very well Israel was not going to attack, and there was no danger for Egypt or Syria, for anybody else. All their thought, all their effort, all the billions of dollars worth of tanks and planes and guns and ammunition and their teaching went for one purpose only, to prepare them for a massive attack on Israel. And here we are, again, in a war which we did not want which we did not initiate. We did everything possible during the six years in order to try to convince our neighbors that bloodshed has never yet solved any problem between neighbors. And another war will only be more death, more bloodshed, more destruction, and no solution. And after all this is over, there is still only one way, one way only <clears throat> to negotiate and to decide, or rather first to decide, that there is a will, a sincere will, to live in peace, and then sit down and negotiate an honorable peace for all concerned. But, as in previous wars, this war was forced upon us. We are a very small people, small in numbers. There's no comparison between the numbers in our army and the numbers in any one of the countries that is fighting against us. And certainly no comparison with the massive armies of men of all those that have joined in this war against us. We do not have that wealth of ammunition that our armies have. But there are two things that we have an advantage over our neighbors. The hatred for war and for death. The pain that everyone in this country, everyone in government, everyone in anywhere in a village or a city feels over the death of one single man. That we have. Maybe it is essential that the heads of states of our neighboring countries begin to feel that. When President Sadat said the other day, war must go on, and he's prepared to sacrifice a million men every year. One shudders 
not at the thought only of a million men giving away their lives, but that the head of a people can say it, that he can make this statement, is something that makes one shudder. We don't want dead on our side. We have no joy in causing death to others. But this people, small as it is, surrounded as it is by enemies, has decided to live. And if we have to pay the price for living, we have to pay it. This is not a people that can give in. Because this people is also a wise people. This people has no fear, not only of tanks and bombers, but it has no fear of reality, of facts. And we know that giving up means death, means destruction of our sovereignty and physical destruction of our entire people. Against that, we will fight with everything that we have within us. And we are confident, despite the difficulties, the war is not yet over. We are in a different position today than we were last Saturday or last Sunday. We have known some very, very bitter hours. But just as we go to our people and tell them that, so they believe us that there isn't the sign of doubt in our hearts, in our conviction, that as bitter as this war is, the end again will be the same as of other wars. We will win because we must live. Our neighbors are fighting not for their lives, not for their sovereignty. They are fighting to destroy us. We will not be destroyed. We dare not be destroyed. Therefore, the spirit of our men in the fronts, the spirit of our people in every home, in every city, in every village, is the spirit of a people that hates war, but knows that in order to live, it must win the war that has been forced upon it. Thank you. Well, so is yours. Yes. This is my, uh, uh, this is my, this is Prime Minister, Michael Cole, BBC Television News. Could I ask you, is it the intention of Israel to take the city of Damascus? And if you take it, how long will you occupy it? And what is your intention for the future? Uh, ladies and gentlemen, you really don't expect me <clears throat> to bring before you an operative plan of what we are going to take and when we take, how long we're going to stay and what will happen. I, I cannot do that. You shouldn't expect me to do that. Stop now. Uh, Prime Minister, uh, would Israel agree to a ceasefire on the basis of the lines that existed in the peace of David, would you repeat the question for can well, the question was to speak up again. Uh, would Israel agree to a ceasefire on the basis of the lines that existed on the 5th of October? There's no sense of speculating to what Israel will agree to or not, as long as from our neighbors to this moment, the best of my knowledge at this moment, not our neighbor to the uh, south, nor our neighbor to the north, has any desire whatsoever to stop fighting. When we come to a proposition of ceasefire, we will consider it very, very seriously and decide because our desire is under possible conditions to stop the war as quickly as possible. Yes, over there. Are getting more? I know of one superpower that has sent in the last few days over 120 planes carrying uh, ammunition and uh, I suppose the rockets and I don't know what else, 
both to Syria, to Iraq, and to Egypt. That's rather some kind of an involvement, I would say. But uh, I don't know what else they want to do. And if somebody will ask me, am I convinced that these planes carry only war material, sorry, I haven't looked into these planes and I don't know. I don't say yes, but I can't say no. Mr. Bauman. Well, I don't think that uh, King Hussein's troops have reached Damascus. They're uh, quite a long, long distance away. But the fact that King Hussein has seen fit after what happened in 1967, again to send in uh, tanks and to uh, have his army as uh, he uh, himself or his uh, government said today uh, on the uh, Syrian front, I can only say that I'm sorry because my predecessor, the late Mr. Eshkol, on the 5th of June, 1967, sent a message to King Hussein through uh, General uh, Bull telling him that if he stays out, nothing will happen to him. He did not stay out, and I'm sure that the king must have the memory rather a, uh, a very unpleasant memory of what happened uh, uh, due to the fact that he came in. I'm sorry that he has done that, but uh, if any tank that stands in our way, uh, we cannot ask for identification whose tank it is. Any tank in our way will be hit Just one second, now let's have some order. Mr. Zeman. Uh, All right, become a goody buddy. Have you asked for any material aid from the United States that we reveal what happened? If you uh, people read <clears throat> the statement of Dr. Kissinger yesterday, in answer to a question of that kind, he said there is an, an ongoing relationship between the United States and Israel as far as uh, military material is concerned. So it's ongoing. Yes. Uh, Prime Minister, in view of the events of the last week, do you still consider the uh, 1967 ceasefire lines as a viable frontier and a safe boundary for Israel? Um, Would you mind me, mind me? Uh, question. Uh, do you consider the 1967 ceasefire lines as a viable front frontier and a safe boundary for Israel? The uh, 1967 ceasefire lines are certainly the best lines that we could have. But every line can be attacked, naturally. But can you imagine what would have happened to us had we moved back to the June 4th, 67 lines with this attack on us, not when we are on the canal, but when we are on the international border. Maybe, I hope at any rate, that people throughout the world that did not exactly go along with us when we said that we will not go back to the pre-67 war borders, and we must have borders that are safer uh, more defend, uh, de uh, defendable than those borders, I hope now they will realize it's not because we wanted some more sand in the Sinai Desert or some more land anywhere else, but we wanted borders that will prevent war. And even if these borders did not prevent war, how much more terrible would it have been for Israel if we had consented at the advice of some of our best friends just to go back where we came from so that we can start all over again? Andy Michael. No, 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 Pardon? Do you now regret not having launched a preemptive strike? Um, yes and no. Yes, because had we done that, there's no doubt that the position would have been much better, and I can say very openly and frankly, probably uh, quite a few lives would have been saved. 
No, because at least we don't have that argument with the world. It's a sad thing, it's a sad comment, but this is the truth. We took that decision with our eyes open, and we hoped till the last minute that maybe, despite our, um, <clears throat> what happened to us in 67, when we tried to get people to prevent this war, we thought maybe this time it will succeed. So it isn't by chance that we took this decision. We knew what we were doing. We knew even that we will probably have to pay for it. But I do not regret, despite all this, that we took that decision. Andy Meisels. My question is for Yes, ma'am. Hi, Prime Minister. Let's talk the National Broadcasting Company in the United States. You said that uh, your forces have gone through some very, very bitter hours since either Saturday or Sunday. I wonder if you could outline a little bit more specifically exactly what the military situation is on the two fronts and what progress your forces have made since the weekend. Can you repeat this question turning over there because I just can't hear the question. <laughs> I don't want to answer. Maybe I can repeat it. Thank you very much. Uh, a friend here said that, since I said that we had some very bitter hours, and may I say, not only our forces had bitter hours. When our forces have bitter hours, others also have bitter hours. Uh, last Saturday and Sunday, could I outline in some way what is happening on our front in the north and in the south? Is that correct? Correct. Well, um, and the, and the Syrian border and the Golan Heights, the Golan Heights are back every inch of it in our hands. The people of the various agricultural settlements are back in their settlements. Our forces are across the border and on the road that, is, that leads to Damascus. Uh, there's quite a change to be in the Golan Heights or to be on the other side of the, uh, the border. Uh, in the south, there, uh, the battle, there's a battle also going on, of course, all the time in the north. In the south, uh, there is a fighting um, now, and um, there probably will be uh, for a few days to come. I would not like to say anything more about the southern front. Mr. Silva. Yes, Mrs. Mayor. Um can you tell us a little more about the implications of King Hussein's decision to send his troops into Syria? The implications on your uh, present eastern frontier. Uh, for instance, we were told only yesterday that the bridges across the Jordan River were still open. Are they open now? We were told earlier in the week that uh, there wasn't the full mobilization because certain soldiers were being kept back for the contingency of uh, Jordan coming into the war. Today, anyone listening to the radio knows that more troops were mobilized. What is for this contingency today? I mean, uh, it would be, um, <clears throat> we would have to be uh, more foolish than we are if uh, a neighbor that is so close geographically to us sends uh, <laughs> part of his force, even if it's not too many, to, in, to aid a country that is fighting us, that we uh, shouldn't have a possibility that if uh, he does something more from across the borders, we should be prepared to meet him. As far as the uh, bridges are concerned, if uh, King Hussein hasn't closed them, they were closed today because on the Sabbath they're always closed. Yeah. And Yom Kippur too. <laughs> Madam Prime Minister, could I ask you for your reaction to the British decision to cut off arms to fighting aid? Do you really need my answer? Uh, what is our reaction to the British decision to cut off arms, the sending of arms to Israel, including that which was bought and paid for and actually on the way out? Uh, I agree. I must, I must say that uh, 
people, decent people, and decent governments, uh, when they come to a point where, if you say it bluntly, a plague on both your houses, or when you say it more gently, we are neutral. That is, the one that attacks and the victim of the attack are exactly in the same position. Uh, somehow, maybe I'm not sensitive enough to the feeling of justice and equality when a government like the government of Great Britain adopts, adopts a position of this kind. It's, uh, in addition to it being uh, uh, bad for us, uh, it's painful to think that a government can do something of that kind. What would, you say to them? what would I say to them? Maybe I'll meet them someday and then I'll say it. Yes, now I'm coming to you in a second. Up, please. Up. Please. As is well known, there's a considerable ghetto of Jews in Syria. Uh, what is your uh, knowledge of the situation concerning the Jews and the intention uh, of the, the uh, I'm sorry, the question is about the situation of the Jews in the ghetto in Syria. There's no doubt that the uh, Jews that live in the, the ghetto in Syria are treated in the most terrible, miserable uh, way. And uh, there we, uh, we certainly will see to it, try at any rate, that when the war is over, and whether there is a uh, ceasefire agreement or some other kind of agreement, that we would ask that these Jews uh, be taken out the same way as we will ask for an exchange of prisoners, these Jews are prisoners that e didn't even fight in the war. And we will certainly do everything within our power to see that these Jews are brought out of, um, from Syria. Gentlemen in the back of the hall. Uh, Mr. Speaker, uh, <coughs> if my questions were not so important, I wouldn't have been struggling so hard to get to ask them. Last Prime Minister. Only those that struggle win. <laughs> Our, uh, our neighbors, if they would only deal with the realities instead of dreams, maybe there would be peace a long time ago. Israel does not face the danger of a lack of supplies. Israel is, is going to fight this war to the very end as long as our neighbors insist upon it and we can take everything that is necessary in order to fight this war until uh, the war is ended with the victory of Israel. Of course, there are difficulties. There are difficulties in supplies. There are difficulties in many other things. But our people can take it. They have been tried before. They are wonderful today more than they ever were before. And we can take all the difficulties and all the hardships. If the neighbors build on that, then they have lost the war before they started. Mr. Smith. Mr. Nair, is there, assuming a favorable outcome that you are confident about, is there any way that you can see now to convert this fighting into the negotiated settlement or any political settlement of the dispute that eluded you in 1967? Uh, ladies and gentlemen, I'm sorry that we cannot come up every day or every week with something new. I'm sorry that we have to repeat the same formula, which I suppose sounds monotonous to very many of you. But yet, this is the truth. We, were, we didn't ask for the War of 67. It was forced upon us, and we won it. No sooner was the war over then the Israel government asked uh, the heads of Arab states 
Now, let us sit down as equals and negotiate a peace treaty. And the answer came back from Khartoum, no recognition, no negotiation, no peace. For six years, like parrots, we have been repeating the same thing. We want to live in peace and cooperation and friendship. Therefore, we say, let us sit down as equals. Let us negotiate without any preconditions. We have ideas of what the border should be. You have ideas of what the border should be. We don't ask you to accept our ideas before we sit down to negotiate. And we don't, and you can't ask us to accept your ideas. For instance, if President Sadat said that he will not give up one inch of the Sinai Peninsula, we said, fine, that's your idea. We don't ask, we don't say to you, oh, since you say this, no, no sense for negotiations. Very good. You say that, we say not the 67 borders, now let's sit down and talk. And you know exactly what the answer was for six years? No negotiations, preconditions, go back to the 67 borders, and then maybe we will negotiate. No treaty, but only a peace agreement. And no real cooperation and recognition of Israel, but uh, which meant practically go back to the 67 borders because for us it will be easier to attack you at the 67 borders than it is on any other border. Uh, that, of course, we couldn't agree to. We have nothing new after this war is over. If we sit down and negotiate, we can come to a peace agreement. There's no doubt whatsoever. We can sign a treaty that will open a new era for the entire area. But that depends upon them. Our friend from Holland over there. Sorry, I'm not, don't hear you.